Hello, everybody. It is Sunday, December the 10th, 2023. We haven't done it. That was the week, a summary of tech news for a couple of weeks. Keith and I were both on the road. Um, and now Keith has or had um, COVID. Uh, and the focus of his newsletter this week is no runway. And in, in, in some ways, Keith, it's a return to some of our more... Um, perpetual themes of the year about venture money rather than all the dramas of open AI. Things return to normal in tech over the last couple of weeks? I don't think return to normal, but a huge reminder to people of what moment we're living through in tech. Maybe, maybe let me rephrase it. Return to abnormal. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? To be, uh, Figuring out what is normal, what is abnormal is a bit of a Hegelian or maybe even um, going back to Greek mythology times, uh, it's a difficult task, what's normal, what's abnormal, but it's certainly quite specific what is happening. Uh, a venture fund closed down this week, a very big venture fund with about $2.5 billion under management and a billion of it still active, um, closed down. And a very large unicorn uh, backed by Andreessen Horowitz also closed down. And there was news from this is D2IQ. Yeah. Um, it had a different name when it started. Uh, I forget what it was now. It's something like Merosphere. Um, and then, and then um, Carter, which is the company that hosts most of the uh, shareholder tables of most startups, announced that the rate of closures is massively accelerated. So it, it, it's a week of, of more and more evidence that Silicon Valley is at the beginning of you know, a very big shakeout. And is the reason for this, Keith, uh, in terms of the, the articles you select for this week, is it about the, the kind of capital investment required for startups these days? It wasn't like in the old days, back in the 90s, we could all do dot-com startups on almost nothing, just off our credit cards. These days, to do an AI startup, for example, like uh, uh, the ones at Inflection AI, for example, you've got to raise hundreds, if not billions of dollars. That That is true, but that isn't the cause of what's happening now. The cause, the cause of what's happening now is all the money invested in 2020 and 2021 at very high valuations um, in more companies than ever before where most of those companies are stranded you know on a high mountain and the tide's gone out and and they're stuck and so they're kind of dropping like flies uh, 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 that's really the cause of this now there is a separate narrative the one you just referred to which is what is 2024 look like and that that you know there, there is a, a bunch of evidence that the startups that are attractive in 2024 are going to require more capital because they're, they're what's commonly known as deep tech, AI being one of the instances of that, and have very large capital expenditures required to even exist. So the whole lean startup era where the cloud drove everything to zero, it is claimed is not true. I'm a skeptic on that narrative. I'm not actually going to agree that that is a correct narrative. I think... There is a subset of startups for whom that's true, but there's going to be plenty of startups that become very big with almost no capital. Some uh, pe people like, um, um, what's his name? Jessica, uh, Jessica Lessin's husband, Sam, at Slow Ventures, actually claims that you may, may have startups that become very large that require zero capital and are solopreneurs, single entrepreneurs due to the leverage you get from ai so i i think it would be too simplistic to go along with the everyone so, so we go through these boom bust cycles all the time e ever since you and i showed up in silicon valley in the 90s why is this one any different so a lot of startups that were overvalued will go bust <clears> and then there'll be another wave a new generation of startups as you say some people like sam uh, lessons suggest that you can get to a billion dollar valuations now without any investment. What's different? 
this one's a bit more systemic because it's it's bigger than any one that happened previously. Bigger as in the number of dollars that are going to be burned. Um, bigger in the number of jobs they're going to go. Bigger in the number of VC funds that won't return capital to their investors. And bigger in terms of the number of limited partners in venture funds that won't be able to keep doing what they've been doing for various structural reasons. So it's it's a lot more systemic and it leads to the question, you know, if you look at the whole value chain of, of startups from seed all the way through to an IPO, what does the future look like is a super hard question to answer. Um, but it's always been a hard, no one's ever known the future. And when they when they think they've known it, they've always got it wrong. Well, structurally, you've been able to explain it. Uh, I think you can't even explain it structurally now. Like, will there be IPOs next year or the year after or the year after that? You've never been able to know that either. You've never been able to predict the IPO market, have you? Not with any precision, but with general direction, I think you have, yeah. But but one, once the river of money gets broken um, and not returned to its source, everything's up for grabs because money doesn't grow on trees. Now, there is one bright spot this week, which is CalPERS, the California Public um, Employees Pension Fund, is, is massively increasing the amount of $4.5 billion venture bet. So what they're investing in, what which funds in particular? Uh, they haven't announced everything, so I, I don't know the answer to that, but it'll be the big, well-known brands. But remember, $4.5 billion is... Is you know under it's about one percent of well, it's still a significant amount of money. I mean, you because you're the founder and CEO of Signal Rank, it always seems to me you have an interest one way or the other, self interest perhaps, in predicting the end of the traditional venture business. Uh, are we still in five or ten years? Are we still going to have all these venture companies, Keith? Yeah, I wouldn't predict the end of the venture business at all. I, in fact, I think it could be the beginning of it thriving in a whole new way, but it's not going to look like the business in the past. J just as after the bubble burst in 2000, um, and at that time there was no such thing as seed funds or even seed investments, it led to the rise of accelerators, incubators, and seed funds to fill the gap left by the death of the 2000 generation. Uh, and now we live in the Silicon Valley with thousands of seed funds and angels. That didn't used to be true. Are they in, who, who's in the worst situation now? Is it the traditional venture capital firms with their massive investments? Is it the accelerators, the early stage people, or is it the later stage investors? I think I think everyone's in some trouble, but the the, the most is the later stage. They, they, they literally have to stop investing. And that leads to a backward set of consequences for the middle and early stages. Um, and it's all driven, of course, by the IPO, IPO market being closed, which means there's no liquidity. So the, the whole thing turns venture capital into the worst version of itself, where it needs a lot of money and it has no liquidity, which is, you know. It, it seems to me, and this comes to one of your new stories of the week about Gemini, uh, Google's release of Gemini, a supposed, at least according to them, a chat GPT killer, is that all the innovation is now coming from big companies. It's not coming from startups. And even OpenAI is in its own weird way a, a, a large tech company. Well, it's certainly supported by Microsoft. Uh, it's almost a division within Microsoft. Well, it, it started life as a big company due to who its founders were. Um, you know, they there were several billionaires there at the founding, so it could have as much capital as required, and that isn't normally the case for a startup. So OpenAI came to life as a big company, and in that sense is a what you might think of as a, a synthetic unicorn by definition. Um, so yeah, big companies, um, because they have deep pockets, can innovate at scale in AI in a way that startups yeah. can't. But that doesn't stop um, AI being um, available to startups to build new businesses as infrastructure mainly. And, and that is happening and will continue to happen. Uh, when, when you look at um, some of the competitors of open AI, 
like uh, anthropic although it's raised a lot of money it didn't need a lot of money to get there and um, even more true of some of the open source especially the image-based ai companies they they bootstrapped uh by getting people to pay revenues for early versions and are now making a lot of money and have never raised any venture capital so i, I do think it's a varied a varied scene and i would expect there to be you know a lot of very large companies that don't require a lot of venture capital keith in your lack of willingness to make serious commitments or or or, or forecasts you're beginning to sound like an ai yourself are you sure you're for real mm -hmm. uh, i've had I, i've had covid this week so i don't feel very real I'm, I'm still testing positive as it is today well we are speaking with keith tear my old friend ceo of signal rank and the uh, the author of an excellent that was the week newsletter everyone should sign up for it a substack based newsletter which keith puts together all the most interesting links going back to this gemini story keith um did it strengthen or undermine google it was hard to tell when it when they released gemini earlier this week the google stock price got a good jump but then all these stories about how the release was cooked. What do you make of this release? Is it interesting in its own way? Um, it, it It's, uh, well, a bit of context. Firstly, they have a much more powerful version that they're only going to release in January called Gemini Ultra. And they have a, a, a micro version called Gemini Nano, which will run on an Android phone. And the one they released this week is the middle version, which by their own definition is is underpowered compared to where they're going that said they showed evidence that it's better than chat gpt on various standard tests so it's clearly a player as in it's competitive they made a huge mistake with the marketing um, and anyone that pays attention will already know this but they released a video that was essentially a fake because it was a uh, edited highlights tied together as if it was real time of what Gemini can do. Very impressive if it was able to do it at all. Less impressive when you realize that to cheat to do the video. And so they under they undermine themselves. They shot themselves in the foot. And now the, the narrative out there is Google is over marketing and over hyping. When actually they've got a very competitive technology that's about to get a lot better. And we assume that OpenAI will respond and have a lot better version of OpenAI in the new year. Meanwhile, it was it was you know grist to the mill for Pete, for our friend Gary Marcus. Yeah, Gary Marcus, who is marketing himself as AI's great skeptic, and he's he's an AI intellectual. He's a he's a he's a smart guy, scientist, physicist. He he claims that Turing test hasn't been solved, and all this generative AI is actually not very impressive. He suggests actually that when you compare it um, to uh, um, some of the earlier AIs, it's actually uh, less impressive. Is there some truth to this? It's a pretty much um, a debate that is, a. if we were talking about the history of religion, it would be like a debate between two branches of a Christian sect about one verse in the Bible. Um, it, basically, this is in-house AI people debating some very important things that most people won't be able to grasp. But in short, I think he's right and he's wrong. I think you're, he's, you're even you're sounding like an AI. He's right. No, no, let me explain what I mean. He's right that large language models are basically statistical word guessing machines incapable of reasoning um, that um, surprisingly get a lot right i would say and he would say shockingly get a lot wrong and it ends up being a matter of opinion about whether you're super impressed by what they get right or whether you're super um, unimpressed by what they get wrong and i I, I fall on the side of, wow, it's amazing what this thing can do. I use it, and it's really, really good for what I use it for, which is mainly uh, software engineering. 
And um, it, nonetheless, it's it's very true that he gets a lot wrong. Uh, like, I, I have to say that and I'm no great techno utopian, but playing around with these AI interfaces, whether it's inflection AI or the anthropic one, Claude, or obviously uh, chat GPT or Gemini, um, uh, the, the Google one, to me, they do pass the Turing test in the sense that you can converse with them online. And actually, it's hard to distinguish that interaction from an interaction with customer service rep, a real human. I mean, to me, yeah. it, it, you're not, they're not pretending to be Habermas or Heidegger or Hegel. They're not pretending to be geniuses, but they are coherent and they engage in conversation, which isn't that different from most of the online marketing conversation. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I agree with that a lot. And that means that there are many human tasks. Not only are they not distinguishable from a human, they're, they're, they're distinguishable by how much better they, than they are than most humans at that same job. So I do think there's, there's millions of jobs, some of which are quite high skills, including teaching and being a specialist in a subject that AIs are already good enough for. And it's just a matter of building the interfaces and the and the uh, tools to to you know deliver the the full version, for example, of a physics professor that is as good as Einstein um, in terms of knowing uh, everything that Einstein knew. But so, no one that is going to be there. I mean, Einstein was exceptional. He wasn't a, a physics teacher. He was a genius. So that the, these yeah, things I'm not talking about be Einstein. No one's ever suggested they will be Einstein. Well, if you define Einstein as a as a kind of a static end game. That is to say, the Einstein that died and everything he knew. A chat GPT can be that person. They'll never invent anything. But only else. after Einstein. They can't make yeah, it. Only after. I agree. Only after. Um, and But they can do that. Well, that's already amazing that they can do that. So why is Gary Marcus, is he just marketing himself as the as the anti-AI guy. I mean, what is he up to here? I think it's the literal truth um, that LLMs and artificial general intelligence, in his view, are not the same thing. Other people, by the way, argue that they agree with him, but it doesn't matter because they look like artificial general intelligence. They're good enough to, to fake it. Therefore, they are it. Uh, and and, and I, I think what you're arguing is more that, that look, if you look at the science of AI, you can argue this is not even AI. It's a statistical word engine. That said, it's so good, it appears to reason and it gets things right most of the time. So by, by those definitions, it, it's probably irrelevant. I think he's the literal purist standing out waiting for the real thing to come along. That's his, that's his key driver. He's not just trying to be a pessimist. He's trying to stand up for purity. And I, I think he'll fail because I think this stuff is good enough that nobody wants to listen to the negatives. And most humans, I know this from my show, most humans are very predictable. They don't say anything particularly interesting or original, even if they think they do. <laughs> so it, it, in many ways, this slightly inadequate, mechanical, monotonous, predictable algorithm and the monotonous predictable humans they're not that different are they they're not if i think if you think of this as a human including all the flaws humans have you won't be far wrong um, yeah, including gary marcus who's who seems to be predictable Let, let's talk i mean ai we come back to every show there was one interesting piece for me uh that you linked to everything you know about the podcast industry is a lie i have to admit the more i podcasting I do, the more this makes sense. What is uh, Amanda Sibling in TechCrunch saying on this that's interesting? Well, I, I put it in because it, it aligned to a couple of other stories. Um, one was about Google shutting down its podcasting service. And the other, which well, I it's not really shutting down, it's shifting from audio to a YouTube video based podcasting service. Yeah, but it's shutting, shutting down what most people think of as podcasts, which are just the audio bit. And it's Morph is trans migrating all the content onto YouTube. You're right. And then Spotify laid off a very large percentage of its workforce 
And the narrative that came with that was that the podcasting bet hasn't paid off for them. So she she keys into some of that stuff and she she's I think she's more or less poo-pooing the idea that podcasting is a business. Um you read it as well, Andrew, and you're more into this than me. So tell me what you well, I, I agree. I don't think it's much of a business. That It's full of middlemen who only muddy the water, who are selling the promise. It's built around advertising. It's very hard. I know my podcast, Keen On, does quite well, but it's very hard to actually sell advertising, especially programmatic advertising. I actually have a feeling that Spotify may be one of these companies that ultimately, it may not be quite a fraud, but I think it's on very thin foundations. I'm not convinced that Spotify is a real company. Are you? No, I think it's a real company. I think uh, it's real in a in a in a in a way that makes it in any way exceptional. I mean, I don't know what its valuation is, but it doesn't strike me as a company that has any really long term viability. Ultimately, it'll probably be acquired by someone else. Well, it's a typical a typical um, middleman in the media world in that it doesn't originate content, so it has very small margins and can only make money at all at scale, therefore, because each unit of time it sells, it makes such a little amount from. So it has to sell a lot of units of time. So it's a, a very, very low margin, but huge business. It's a big business. Um, and that throws off, you know, when it's profitable, it can throw off enough cash um, to, to, you know. But there are real businesses in this space. Obviously, Apple, Amazon in their own way, and even Netflix. I just don't see how Spotify really competes against them. And I don't think they're particularly, I think they overinvested in podcasting. Well, A lot of it is just. I don't know. It may not be quite fraudulent, but it's very. The whole thing is so dodgy on so many fronts. Well, you're you're mixing words that suggest criminality with words. No, that... I'm not. I'm not suggesting they're criminal. I'm suggesting that it's one of those platforms that seems to sort of go with the wind and uh, and and use whatever is fashionable at the time, but it never really has a coherent business. Well, the, the, another way of saying what you're saying is that. Uh, there isn't enough value being produced by that business for it to survive against. Right. That's business. Exactly. Right. And, yeah. and I don't know what a historical equivalents are of, of the, those kinds of companies that always it, oh, seem to be in the right place at the right time, but actually are always late arrivers. Almost any aggregator is like that because they're, they're, they're having to pay for content usually. And they're not selling it for very much. So but by definition, they're on very thin ground. Whereas Apple, you know, makes money from the iPhone. Amazon makes money from Amazon. Uh, Netflix, uh, sort, you know, invests money to make its own content and gets all of the subscription revenue back for itself, not just a piece of it. So those are real businesses with high gross margins. And that that's the secret of startups. When I teach startup life to founders unit economics meaning what do you sell and how much for and gross margin meaning how much of that comes to you those are the keys to all businesses and if the answer is um that you make either a lot or a small amount with what you sell but the gross margins are small that's a very different answer to the gross margins being 80 percent or more which is typical for software businesses so yeah i think it's um it's at the very core it, this is an old story which it's is, an old story it's old technology it's old ideas it's not a disruptive business so yeah. i've got keith to go human again he's going short on spotify i'm particularly short on them we'll see how that works out in terms of stuff uh, one thing is for sure spotify is not our startup of the week your startup of the week keith is a much more revolutionary idea animate anyone uh, which according uh, to your headline, heralds the approach of full motion deep fakes, which is, of course, part of our new age of AI. Tell me about Animate Anyone. So the, these are uh, Stanford students. Uh, where have we heard that before? Uh, Larry and Sergey back in the day. And um, they've suspended their PhD courses having 
built algorithms that appear from their publicity. Uh, they haven't yet shipped anything that we can use to see, but they've shown demos. It looks as if they can animate from a photograph and create basically a personality. And when, when you add to that what's happening with voice synth synthesization, or oh, is that a word? Anyway, you know what I mean. Um, and, uh, you know, the well, day when... The day when to speech uh, software. Right. So the day when you and me could be animated versions of photographs of each other, and uh, when we are speaking, it could sound like us, and we could just throw a script into the streaming service instead of having to be there ourselves, and no one would know the difference. It, it kind of... Yeah. And I think this speaks to the the real shift in this age of AI, which is an ontological one, to redefining what exactly we mean by the word reality, or perhaps even undermining the notion of reality, of not knowing what to trust or who to trust, because the products of companies like Animate Anyone suggest that you can, you can create deep fakes, which are indistinguishable from what we once thought of as real. So this is the beginning of something very different. Very, and again, very different from companies like Spotify, which seem to be imprisoned in the old world, the, the old pre-AI world. Yeah. By the way, these are uh, students. Uh, they're all uh, Chinese students at Stanford. Um, and there's a big, there's more and more evidence that the expertise of Chinese uh, universities and uh, students that come out of China is is growing very very fast and and the idea that there's a wall between china and the us is becoming less and less true yeah i'm guessing that it won't be long before conservatives will jump on this and suggest that the chinese are in the business of destroying reality or at least our sense of reality but the chinese uh, and again generalizing about the chinese versus the americans is dangerous but they are they understand this, perhaps, or the country understands the future better than the Americans, don't they, Keith? The opportunities, the challenges, and certainly the technology. I th yeah, that you're asking me to kind of give a binary answer there about, but I do think China is an equal in every way, and in some fields uh, is advanced. But by the way, so too is Japan when it comes to animation and computer vision and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, America is there too. Um, I think it ends up being about productization more than national origins. And what's happening recently, which is new, is Chinese source technologies are getting productized and becoming popular, TikTok being the obvious example. Some of the TikTok um, tools to create TikToks are way ahead of anything Facebook has, for example. Well, Facebook seems much more in the, the Spotify camp. The New York Times talks, and this comes back to the theme of your newsletter, from unicorns to zombies. But it's these new companies like Animate Anyone that's getting the money. I don't really convinced that anything is that different. Old technologies, the things just move so fast that what once was new and revolutionary or at least disruptive is now conservative. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, think about language translation. We're probably less than a year away from me speaking English and a, and a French listener hearing French in real time, and it being good French. Using my more voice. English, I'm sure, better than your Yorkshire English, anyway. Hey, oh, should I say a? <laughs> hey, well, we're on, Keith, to the final feature of this week which is your ex of the week and you have a gary marcus thing this is from gary marcus too what's gary uh i'm not sure whether you're critical of him or not what's the the ex of the week this week well no the the thread the thread is the thread where he was knocking um doing his turing test hasn't been proven thing but then uh, sam altman was the at the center and if you put it back on screen you'll see that somebody replied to sam altman with with an anti-semitic jibe um which is in the spirit of current times uh, and where anti-semitism is on the rise and gary marcus to his great credit he uh, did not accept this person's comment as supportive and said hey that, that 
that that's not okay um, and came to the defense of Altman. And, and I put it in just because um, I don't know about you, Andrew, but my Twitter is full of explicit anti-Semitism. Um, it just blows me away. And in the week where the Senate hearings happened and the head of Penn State University has now had to resign uh, for reasons we all know. Um, I don't think it's any different, though, from explicit anti-black or anti-white or anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, and, and the thing with this tweet is that this guy, and I'm not sure if he's the same one, Mazar Mohammed, is probably a fake. So he's... <sighs> He's he's a bot of some sort created by someone for some reason. So I'm not sure really of his significance here. Yeah, well, uh, it's significant only in the context. The, the, that specific tweet may or may not be significant, but I think <clears throat> the context is real. And they're complex issues. You and me may not see eye to eye on if we got into it, which we won't because it's not what our show's about. But um, I just wanted to put on the record that um, I, for one, uh, think that anti-Semitism is a growing problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I have to admit I don't agree, but that, that's probably a subject for another show. What I do think, though, and you may be right on all the explicit anti-Semitism and anti-Islam and uh, whites and blacks on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, is it does speak of um, the increasing irrelevance of X. Um, but or, or, um, or, the, or that's in um, for me that's in the dead pile with uh with spotify see for it's me it's the, and irrelevant increasingly i don't even know why anyone goes on it. for me it's the opposite um it's the increasing relevance of it i mean where where else is most conversation happening but it's not even real conversation it's conversation between you or some people like you and bots you don't even know if these people are real they're throwing stupid insults of one another it's like going back to being four years old so what no that i mean that's an example of that but i agree but that isn't what you mainly find on x There's, there is some rational discussion happening there and it, it but it's also go to threads or facebook and try to find anything substantive that's discussing the what are seriously real issues you won't find it but you will find it on x yeah, I think these are the dying days of a pre-AI age, which social media has revealed is doesn't really work very well. And we get to the the new world of animate anyone, of open AI, of Gemini. We're in a new world where a lot of these issues will just simply go away. They're irrelevant. Well, uh, un unless the bad guys produce their own animated avatars spouting rubbish. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. When it's cold outside.